Welcome back, 2021ers. This lecture will continue our discussion of virtual memory. A few logistics items as we get underway. Be having a look at Chapter 9 of Brian O'Halloran, mentioned up here in the upper left. This will detail some of what's at stake in terms of the virtual memory system and supplement what we're discussing in our lectures together. Also have a look ahead at chapter seven on linking and the object file format known as ELF that's employed by a lot of Unix systems. That'll be the last topic that we deal with. You can see our rough agenda over the next week or so on the right hand side of the screen. Over here we'll have a couple more lectures to finish up virtual memory and Wednesday we'll probably finish up relatively soon and may start our discussion of object code and linking there as well. That'll take us through to the end of the semester and by goodness we are already there. Just a week after you'll be viewing this on Monday the 27th, we'll have our last lecture meeting together. And after that, it will be on to the end semester. Uh, we'll have your Project 5 ready for you the next day or so, and that will be due a couple days after the last lecture. Uh, the fourth project, in case you had forgotten, is due on Monday, so make sure to be finishing that up, testing your code on Atlas and uh, preparing. It'll be some time before the final exam actually occurs. We're going to have a joint final exam between both the morning and the afternoon section. Unfortunately, this is on the last day of final, uh, final exams are given, and it'll be 1.30 to 3.30 on Wednesday, May 13th. Do mark your calendar for that. We left off last time having discussed some of the issues that are at stake with respect to the virtual memory system. And this exercise that we ended with is something that you might want to use to refresh your memory. I'll pause for just a moment to allow you to pause as well, reflect on these, uh, and look up answers in case anything is unfamiliar. So quickly, we discussed in our first lecture on virtual memory that the fact that a running program would use a memory address like 1024 uh, and think of it as referring to some spot in main memory, DRAM, uh, this is actually a facade that the operating system and the hardware conspire to translate this virtual address into something else. Now this makes it possible for two programs that are simultaneously running to both think that they have virtual memory address 1024 because it's not an actual address. There is some fancy hardware, the Memory Management Unit, MMU. It has a cache called the Translation Lookaside Buffer, TLB. And they're largely responsible for taking that 1024 that the program makes a request for and figuring out where in physical memory it actually resides. Memory is paged into chunks, and it's the case then that this memory address 1024 falls into one of those chunks, and the MMU and the TLB along with the operating system maintain a data structure about what virtual pages correspond to actual physical pages. So the addresses that a program would see from zero to 4,095 or so, they're on one page, both virtually and physically, uh, page zero as it were. As you would move to address 4096 up to 81 something or other, uh, this would be on a second page. In terms of virtual memory, uh, going from 4095 to 4096 looks like a linear change, but because the operating system maps pages of memory uh, virtually to potentially different distinct physical locations, uh, then you will find potentially a big jump in the physical address that this is translated to. This common size, 4 kilobytes or 4096 bytes, is what a lot of operating system and uh, systems and hardware support. And it's primarily what the page table does, is to maintain a translation of a virtual page to a physical page that allows an individual byte level virtual address to be translated to a, a byte level physical address. This is reviewed in the slide that comes after this exercise. So have a look at this and the slides that proceed in order to reacquaint yourself in case this got rusty between our last conversation about virtual memory and the exam. To move forwards, we need to talk a little bit about the structure of this page table. Now we commented earlier that most actual hardware doesn't support a full 64-bit address, that in fact there are parts of those address bits, those 64 bits, that are largely either ignored or held constant, oftentimes uh, as ones. Uh, to that end, with each page being uh, 4 kilobytes, which takes you 12 bits in order to access within a hunk. 
This leaves you on a typical processor uh, with 48 uh, uh, sort of, uh, sorry, uh, 48 bits uh, to address things uh, virtually. If you knock off the 12 bits here, this leaves you with how many virtual pages uh, that your, your program would have access to, and thus gives an idea of how big a page table has to be in order to map uh, those pages to a second page. Now think just for a moment about how big this would be. Uh, if you're curious how to calculate it, uh, then you would take this 2 to the 48th bytes that one could address in virtual space, and you would knock off, uh, I'm not mapping every individual byte location to separate spots, but I'm doing so on pages. So the, that would have to knock out and divide this by 2 to the 12th. Uh, that would leave you, if you do that division, and make use of the handy uh, fact that when you divide 2 to the 48th by the size of each page, uh, 2 to the 12th, you just need to subtract exponents. So that's two to the 36th pages. And this is what the operating system has promised to keep track of per process. That's per running program, there are two to the 36th different pages uh, that it may actually have to keep track of. This at first guess might seem uh, not that big of a deal until you recognize how big two to the 36th is. We've discussed some conventions, but it bears uh, sort of repeating and explicit sort of mention. 2 to the 10th is 1 kilobyte, 2 to the 20th is 1 gigabyte, and 2 to the 30th would be 1 terabyte. Uh, so if you give yourself even just a small amount of information per page, uh, 2 to the 36 pages could take in the petabytes of uh, information uh, that's required in order to uh, store. Uh, that's at least a terabyte of space just to store the, ter uh, the page table. Now you have to keep in mind then uh, that this page table, it's a data structure that's held per process. And our whole point was to make it possible for the operating system uh, to flexibly map some area of memory that the program sees to a physical area uh, without inducing too much overhead and a terabyte of space in order to store this kind of uh, stuff uh, is just a ridiculous amount that this would completely exhaust the memory that most systems have out of the box and so you should recognize at this point uh, this isn't really the case that there must be some fallacy here that again we've been lying to you about this stuff um, this is only applicable to the direct mapped uh, source of page uh, instances, where you would take this virtual address and you'd say this directory entry or page number here. This tells me where I'm going to head. Uh, and then the last few bits, 12 in our case, uh, this gives you the physical address within that physical page. Uh, if you give yourself a little bit more of a data structure rather than a table lookup, uh, you can actually make some progress on this. And so the typical scheme that most OSs and hardwares conspire to create is a so-called multi-level page table. And this is where the notion of a page table actually starts to break down a little bit. A page tree would be somewhat more appropriate. If you take the typical virtual address up here and account for the bits that actually mean something in terms of that address, then a typical scheme is to divide it into hunks that the first few bits that mean anything give you an entry into one level of the page table and there if there's a data structure present uh, at uh, this instance uh, then it will have pointers to lower levels in the page table in a branching sort of tree scheme we'll underscore that in a little bit more detail in just a moment the next few bits in the address then, once you have chased a pointer where this first index gives you which uh, array entry in this directory uh, to follow, uh, then the next few bits will uh, indicate which of this table entries uh, to follow, and so on down the line until you finally reach uh, a physical location where the last few bits in the address are used to offset into that uh, to find the actual physical byte level address. The kind of diagram that we're examining here uh, is a little bit difficult to follow. Uh, for instance, the three to four levels here that are listed individually uh, actually can branch out so that there are a number of different level entries in here, uh, creating a sort of fat uh, tree-like structure. And importantly, one of the sources of efficiency for something that looks like this is that any page table entry that is blank is essentially presumed null, and so there's a whole swath of addresses that 
uh, for instance, up at this higher level, uh, would not be mapped at all uh, physically. Uh, and this is where you can get to those out of bounds pages that lead to segmentation faults. So you think of each of these things as an array, uh, giving a, a pointer to a lower level, uh, and this then being a sort of multi-way tree. Uh, this is a better way, a better observed uh, by and compared to the direct uh, page table mapping like structure that we like to think about uh, in the following diagram. So over on the left first is what we tend to sort of reason about page tables as doing is that over here I have a virtual page number uh, and for each virtual page there is an index in this array uh, that indicates where in physical DRAM uh, this is actually stored. Uh, so you can see over here uh, each of the virtual pages it has a number that is indicated in binary but many of the pages here uh, have little slashes that are nulls uh, and they don't lead any place. So that if someone were to access something on page uh, eight here, or sorry, uh, page four rather. Uh, this is not mapped any place and so would lead to a segmentation fault. Versus if someone attempted to access an address on page two, this is presently stored in the page table as mapping to physical page uh, down here of, I think that's nine. Uh, and there's some data that's down there. The data here is somewhat inconsequential. Um, and anything that sort of doesn't have data in it is considered sort of not mapped at the moment. Uh, you'll see over here I have numbered these bits up to five and so we have up to 32 different pages we could map and that requires in this direct mapping scheme 32 entries in this array. Only four of them are mapped at this point. Uh, and so over here you have, uh, sorry, three of them are mapped. Uh, where we have a page here, a page here, and a page here, three total pages mapped. Uh, if you come over to the right hand side you'll see a multi-level scheme. And importantly here, the way that this five bit address, and you'll see the five bits over here that corresponds to uh, the, the page numbers, these five bit addresses, uh, what they have been divided into is three bits for the first level and two bits for the second level. And much as we did when we discussed caches, it's an architecture specific feature as to how you divide up bits of an address and what they correspond to in page tables. At any rate, in this example, we'll still have the same three pages mapped, and you can see them again here in red, blue, and green, uh, mapped to the same physical locations in DRAM over here. What we have changed, though, is that up at the top level, there are only eight entries uh, here, and the 32 that we had is a sort of single monolithic array. It's actually being divided into chunks, uh, where in this first level of the page table, there are only two pointers uh, that point uh, downwards into the second level. So you'd peel off the first three parts of the bits associated with the page address uh, and fish out an entry in here. If those first three bits uh, were 100, you would look at this entry here, find it's not mapped, and the OS would result in a page fault and probably a segmentation fault being given to the program. Versus if the first three bits of the address were 111, uh, then that would take you further down into this tree-like structure to the next level entry. And we only have two levels here, uh, divided three bits for the first, two bits for the second. Uh, but you can see then that this uh, top level root node associated with that uh, page like or a uh, page tree structure it has eight possible children only two of them uh, being fulfilled at the moment uh, down here the 111 leads me to this entry of up to four things uh, where two of the pages are mapped uh, and this first uh, entry up here the page 000 it's mapped up to this set of entries uh, where one of the pages is mapped same physical locations so the net effect of both these structures, both the left-hand side direct mapped array uh, and this tree-like structure here, are to map the virtual pages uh, 0010 uh, to this particular spot, uh, the virtual page 11100 and 11110 uh, to different physical locations. Importantly then, in terms of comparison, uh, you would be easily able to see what the ratio of how much I've stored to how much memory was required uh, by taking what's the total size of this array, uh, 32 entries, and then divide into that the three pages I actually mapped. Uh, so that's uh, 3 into 32 here. Uh, 
the, on, in contrast, over on the right hand side, I'm still mapping three pages. Uh, and so what I'd count then is how many total sort of entries across the tree I have stored or required in memory. To that end, I have eight here, uh, and then four a piece uh, for these two for a total of 16 entries here, as in 16 nodes here that that needs sort of storing in some uh, way, shape, or form. Uh, to that end, going from 32 entries in the direct array uh, to 16 entries over the right-hand side uh, is a big savings. And the 50% savings here is indicative that uh, I can get some mileage out of this kind of a scheme so long as I do not have a large swath of my address space mapped at any given instance. Now, in a sort of modern architecture, we have 48 some bits uh, of virtual address space, 36 of which, uh, so two to 36 different pages that can be mapped. Uh, it's very, very rare that you would get even a small fraction of that. We're talking 1%, 2% of the address space that, that would be mapped. And so storing a ginormous array uh, like this on the left-hand side, that was where you would get this sort of, it takes me a terabyte of space in order to uh, store the page tape. Uh, completely impractical. On the other hand, because most programs don't actually map much of their address space, only the 1 to 5% or so uh, of the pages that could be mapped are needed, you'll get a lot of savings out of a tree-like structure like this. Uh, the more bits you have and the less of the address space that's mapped, uh, the better your sort of ratio of savings here is, is compared to the direct mapped equivalent. And so this is where uh, the name page table, I think, is somewhat inappropriate. The only way to do this in modern architecture with large uh, architectures with large address space is to use this clever tree-like data structure. Now, this gives some rise then to what the source of some inefficiencies uh, in the virtual memory system uh, might actually be. Where as you would want uh, to translate an address, for instance, if the memory management unit, MMU, misses in its TLB and has to look this up in this tree-like structure, then it takes you several steps to start at the root node, determine which uh, bits of the address indicate which of these pointers I should follow, chase that down, peel off the next set of bits, uh, and then follow an entry further down in the table. Uh, this happens between three and four times. Uh, you can see then that there's a mild logarithmic effect here as uh, the sort of wider the tree is, uh, the more I have to traverse downwards on this one. But importantly, because I've made some fixed decisions about this address being 48 some bits long, 36 of which indicate page. Uh, to that end, I'm only going to have to traverse uh, a few links here, three to four, not uh, typically. Uh, and to that end, then it's a very mild effect and very mild uh, sort of drawback in terms of performance uh, when it comes to page trees that look like this. And the huge benefit then is in terms of space savings. Uh, that I don't have to spend gigabytes and gigabytes or even terabytes of memory uh, to store these page tables. They can be scored in a few kilobytes uh, per process that is running. That's the only way to make this kind of system practical. Uh, here's an example again of this phenomenon coming out of your uh, textbook lecture slides uh, that are associated with the textbook itself, uh, where you can see a large swath of the address space over here uh, between page table entry 1 and page table entry 8. Uh, they're not mapped. And then down here are a whole swath more uh, page tables just aren't mapped on that front. Uh, this means that in terms of the virtual memory that this program is actually using, uh, there's large gaps here uh, that are just not present. Uh, and this is the typical structure of most actual uh, programs running, that they don't need uh, hundreds and hundreds of megabytes uh, to run in most cases. And so it doesn't make sense to use lots and lots of space within the page table entries in order to store this stuff uh, by saying there's a nulls here, you cut out all of these page table entries down here, and by saying this swap is also nulls, then there's no space wasted trying to map that stuff. Uh, the first point you see a null in here, you get a segmentation fault as addresses are looked up. So it's a very clever uh, data structure, this one, and worth knowing about if for no other reason uh, than it's uh, a way to construct interesting uh, sort of lookups uh, that may see some application in a project at some point. For the moment, we're going to turn our attention to one of the very interesting tools that this virtual memory system can provide for us. I'd like you to take a moment and just recall how to do the following simple task. 
write a program that will read in the characters of text file and just print them out. This is very much like the cat utility. And if you've forgotten or never know, uh, there's this little utility called cat. Uh, let me change over here to this stuff. Uh, and the cat utility, all it does is put things on the screen. Uh, so for instance, if I were to put on the screen this little Gettysburg, uh, which is the Gettysburg address, uh, all it does is put it on the screen. I want a C program that does more or less the same thing. Uh, the answer to this uh, that we'll discuss in just a moment is in printfile.c. Uh, but take a moment, see if you can at least recall the kinds of code structures and library functions that you'd use in standard standard C in order to make this happen. Uh, and then we'll have a look at what I think of as the main solution. That should be long enough for those curious to try this out to, to get a chance. Uh, for those who want to skip straight to the goods, now here's my version of this program. Now certainly you should have remembered at least that you'll need to open up a file, uh, fn in this case, uh, sorry, uh, which I called fn, and the fopen uh, c standard function does this. Uh, you have to pass it in a name and uh, how to treat that file this time uh, for reading. I'm going to grab my file uh, from the command line using this argv. Uh, these are arguments to main uh, that indicate what's been passed on the command line. You should also have recognized that there has to be some kind of a loop that happens here, so a while one part. Uh, and probably recognize that there has to be an invocation of fscanf to read something from the, the file. Uh, you read until you get end a file uh, from back from that function and then probably quit this loop. There are a lot of variants uh, for this kind of behavior, but this is sufficient for the moment. It's not terribly important to me, but if you remembered, there is a way to read single characters in, which is handy if you don't want to skip over white space or anything like that and don't know whatever else it is uh, that's going to be coming in. You can read in percent %c's uh, single characters, as it were, uh, and then print those characters out. That means that if I compile this program over here, uh, gcc uh, print file dot c, uh, and then run it on gettysburg.txt, uh, then I get more or less the same effect as cat, uh, that the stuff that it was in this file is read in character by character, and each of those characters in turn are put on the screen until I try to f scan f a character after this last date here and get out a end of file indication, uh, which caused me to kick out of here, close up the file, and I'm good to go. The important thing that I want to focus your attention on uh, is the following. Every time I read from the file, I have to get information and store it someplace in my program. In this case, in the form of a little input character here that's filled in by this call to fscanf on uh, that I subsequently print out. Now that doesn't seem tremendously innocuous, uh, and it's worth mentioning that reading a character at a time like this can be inefficient, although it's a little harder to say for certain by one way or the other uh, in, in these days. Uh, but we'll talk about that again in a second. Uh, but bear in mind then that uh, what I have here is a sort of temporary store for something that's in the file that I'm going to put into my program. All right. We're going to contrast this with another program uh, that I will compile presently. This is a GCC MMAP, uh, this, uh, let's see, print file. Uh, and the first thing I want you to understand about this is that it does the same thing. Uh, I now have a new a.out that's based on this mmap, uh, and if I do the uh, a.out uh, on that Gettysburg, I still see like this stuff come out just like Cat did. I'm going to pull this program up, and what we'll do is to have you guys spend just a minute to examine this thing, uh, because it's somewhat interesting the way that this structure uh, takes uh, a different turn. Take a moment, examine this, and determine what are the central differences between left-hand side program that uses your standard fscanf and right-hand side program that introduces a couple new things along with some old things. So point out as many differences as you can, garner what you can from the comments that you can see, uh, but generally try to understand what differences there are between these two uh, and what functions importantly are introduced over on the right-hand side. I'll pause for just a tick. All right, it's probably worthwhile to pull up some line numbers here. Uh, here. Okay, uh, so starting from the top, we have the same basic setup uh, in that I'm going to read this argument uh, that's coming in as the file name. It'll be an argv1. You'll notice I used a somewhat different opening function here uh, called just open rather than fopen. 
We won't go into the details of this too terribly much, uh, but this is actually a lower level open function uh, that is associated with Unix systems. It's a direct system call, and in most cases, f open as a C standard call, as this would be run on Unix systems, would eventually sort of devolve down to an open uh, at the lower level. If you were running this C standard function on a Windows system, uh, for instance, instead, uh, there's no guarantee that you get this same low level open as Windows systems are not necessarily Unix like. And so uh, this being a Unix specific call uh, isn't necessarily the case. You'll have the same behavior uh, with the relationship between F open and open uh, on Windows systems. We then turn uh, over to this uh, second, uh, sorry, this uh, stat function. And you can see that this uh, stat family that we saw very early on the semester is doing something interesting. It's making a request on this open file to, to find out how big is it? How many bytes big is it? Uh, and that's garnered by first setting up a little stat structure, uh, which is gonna store a results that the operating system can tell about this file. Calling fstat, uh, which is just like standard stat like this, except it's called on an open file descriptor, this little FD guy. Uh, and then extracting from this stat uh, buff the field st size, which is how many bytes big uh, this file is. We did this quite a while ago uh, in project one even, in order to make it possible to easily read in all of the bytes that are in a file. Uh, but for the moment, we're doing it for somewhat different purposes to set up the following mmap call. This is a function that is incredibly useful. Uh, it's short for memory map. Uh, the arguments that uh, lay out here in brief are a null as its first argument to indicate you can use operating system any address uh, for the memory you're mapping uh, that you want. Uh, size comes from the file of uh, uh, size of the, the file here. Uh, this protection read uh, means that I only want to be reading the memory that I'm going to be mapping. Map shared is, indicates that I want to share this uh, mapping with anybody else on the system. Uh, this isn't particularly important at the moment because uh, we are going to be collaborating with this shared uh, this map memory with any other entities but it gives you some sense of what's possible there. FD, uh, this file descriptor I opened that's associated with the file earlier, and the zero over here is uh, no uh, additional options uh, to the MMAP. Now, now, the effect of this uh, may seem a little mysterious at first, but let's see how it plays out in terms of the program uh, activities later on. Uh, importantly, uh, the results of this function call, they are assigned to the file cars variable, which appears to be just a pointer to character data. What's done subsequently then is to just walk through this file cares as though it were an array and print out every character that's in there followed eventually by a new line. This is the only printing that's happening and you can see there doesn't appear to be any other reading aside from whatever this mmap uh, is potentially doing. Uh, after printing out whatever is associated with file cars, uh, the munmap or uh, munmap is called uh, to close down the map, uh, get rid of the file descriptor, and eventually bail out the program. Uh, but the net effect of all this is to create a pointer from your program's virtual memory space uh, into directly uh, where the bytes for this file are stored. The operating system typically picks up files that are saved on disk, plops them down in a RAM buffer in order to make the reading of those files more efficient. And this MMAP request gives you direct access to that, uh, um, uh, that set of data. Uh, importantly then, uh, this character pointer here, file cars, uh, points right into that data so you can scan it as though it were an array that belongs to your program. Uh, that's what the meaning of this sort of file cars with the I is, is give me some index offset from this file cars uh, and that by virtue of the translation that the operating system sets up here is going to point directly to a character that's in this uh, Gettysburg file. Uh, so the way that you can think about it then is if I pull up Gettysburg as a text file over here, you can see it on the left hand side. As this mmap completes, this car uh, pointer file cars points up here to the zeroth position in this file. At that spot is an F. And so dereferencing it to become an, uh, a character here uh, and printing it out, we'll put a capital F on the screen and then a lowercase o for the one position and then a uh, U for the tooth position and so on down the line. 
this isn't like a standard F scanf uh, in that there's no sort of tracking a position automatically done by the operating system, but instead I can use whatever tracking mechanism I want, uh, where this I index here becomes an index into all of the bytes associated with this thing. Importantly also then, and I should pull up the sort of other print file we had over here. Uh, since I have direct access to that space, there's no need to scan something into memory associated with my program in the form of this single character over here, only to print it out and then replace it. Uh, instead, I have a direct pointer to that stuff, so can print it out uh, more or less unhindered, uh, as in this will be direct prints of those, those uh, uh, bytes that are in the file. So then, and this is a tremendously useful and convenient way uh, that one can go about uh, accessing the data that is in a file. Uh, we've seen so far that this is associated with character data, and we'll play with that for a little while longer, uh, but this is an arbitrary sort of map in memory that's in a file, whether or not it's um, textural data or binary data uh, doesn't matter and this will make it very easy for us to traverse certain kinds of binary files uh, by treating them as a pointer to some sort of a C structure uh, and accessing their data through field dereferences there. But first uh, let's have a little bit of fun with this. Uh, I think we've more or less gone over uh, this stuff. Uh, the first thing that I want to mention then and sort of reiterate is uh, the semantics associated with this mmap. You can see there are a lot of arguments to this and it gives you a sense of uh, some of the flexibility associated with mmap. Uh, but uh, you don't necessarily have to memorize these. Instead, look up examples or refer to the manual page associated with mmap uh, in order to recall those things. In order to get this to work, you will need to play with the lower level Unix open, uh, which returns an integer known as a file descriptor. That kind of stuff is discussed in much more detail in an operating systems class, so I won't dwell upon it right now. Uh, but this little incantation of opening up using an FD and the low level open system call, along with mmap and plumping in the right options over here, allows you to then directly access characters that are in that file. Uh, we've seen so far this is good for printing, uh, but it also allows you to do things like changing the file. Uh, and you'll notice over here uh, in the mmap that shows up in the middle of this slide, uh, the only change that I've made over the options we explored for, uh, earlier is that I have masked on uh, protection right as well. You notice here the little single bar. This is a bit mask, or sorry, a bitwise uh, or, uh, and it will combine the read and the write permissions here uh, for this. Very common in Unix system calls to pass several options melded together uh, in sort of uh, a single integer uh, by use of these or bitwise ors. And so expect to see more of those as you would move ahead and look at more uh, mmap uh, sorts of, uh, or uh, mmap and other system calls. So we'll have a quick look uh, at this mmaptr utility, which is another text utility. Uh, I want to first demonstrate uh, what it's used for. And so I'll come back over to the shell and compile it, uh, compile it mmaptr.c. Uh, in case you didn't know, uh, there's a little Unix utility called tr that is short for transliterate. Uh, and it transforms characters uh, from one to another. Uh, basic invocation is something like a dot out. You have to say uh, what the file name is, and then you have to say what characters you want to transform to what other characters. Uh, we will say transform f's uh, to f's, uh, and uh, maybe we'll put the lowercase version of that too. This is the most humorous of them. Uh, so you notice some feedback from the program here uh, that it's transforming those things. And if I now have a look at that gettysburg.txt uh, and reload it, you can see this file's actually changed. It now reads poor score and seven years ago, our fathers brought for Porth on this continent, a new nation conceived in liberty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is probably flipping it in his grave just as he does every time I run this example. Or maybe he's chuckling. I, I, he's uh, said to be a humorous uh, person. Uh, at any rate, uh, the changes up here are, are something that would be somewhat difficult potentially to create if you were doing this as a standard C program on account of having to scan in characters and then back up the file pointer in order to put characters in in case you saw something uh, that you wanted to transliterate. 
On the other hand, using mmap for this mounts to a very simple uh, transformation uh, or a very simple code flow here. So let me open up mmap tr here and you can have a look. Uh, you can see that the basic setup is similar to what we did before, although I have more arguments now. I need not only a file name, but an in character and an out character. Keep in mind that these argv things come in as character pointers uh, or arrays of characters or strings, as it were. And for the second and the third, I just want to fish out the zeroth character. So that capital P or capital F and capital P and lowercase uh, P and lowercase F. Uh, we could probably expand this a little bit, but I'm not going to bother at this point. Print on a message, uh, perform the memory map with this time with the write permissions uh, mentioned down over here. And then treat this thing just as if it were an array that's in memory now. I have the notion of how big it is, how many characters from my earlier stat. I'm just going to iterate over all these, looking to see if the character in the file that appears as an array right now, if it's equal to the input character that I'm trying to transform, then assign the output character to it. Now, in a standard C input output program, this would involve something like an scanf and then a like a rewind or a, a sort of uh, f seek backwards by a character, uh, and then an f uh, printf with a percent c would be sort of tedious. Uh, here, it's like changing a character in an array. It just so happens that by virtue of this memory map that array corresponds to the actual bytes that are in the file. And the operating system, uh, pleasingly, will go about uh, ar arranging for uh, the file bytes to actually change in correspondence to changes that I make to this thing because they really are the same thing. Uh, this makes it relatively easy then to make changes uh, correspond to algorithms like this or many other sorts of instances. Anything that you could do to a C variable here, uh, you the, can then therefore do as a change to the file that's in there. And we'll see an example in just a second of, uh, of sort of alternatives to that. Um, now, I want to uh, underscore one thing here that this par kind of transformation is possible only because of the virtual memory system that the standard operating system sort of facilities to handle files uh, allow you to call functions to sort of interact in an indirect way where only the operating system really knows where things are. But this mmap business works to map part of the virtual address space associated with a program directly to a file instead. And if you didn't have this notion of indirection, then probably this would not be possible. Then you'd have to resort more to the traditional types of input output functions, uh, your f scanfs, your f reads, your f printfs, etc., in order to get this kind of a job done, uh, thereby making your task a little bit more difficult. So it's only through the virtual memory system that you see this mmap business actually provide this kind of a service to user level programs. If you're curious about how this looks in more detail, then I encourage you to look ahead because uh, this is the kind of thing, again, that is studied in some more detail in an operating systems class. Uh, but we'll get some utility out of this, and it's a useful thing to have in your bag of tricks uh, as you move ahead in programming. Uh, I want to mention that this business of mmapping is not restricted just to character files, uh, that there's an example in here of a program called mmap increment. And this works on binary data, uh, where I would be opening up a file for read and writing, but again with this low-level opening. Uh, and instead of mmapping and assigning this to a character pointer, I'll assign it to an integer pointer. And this is because the data that is in there actually is a binary sets of integers. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, so over here, if I have a look at this... Uh, See binary int.dat. If I try to open up that in my text editor, you can see it displays a lot of gibberish right now. And that's on account of these things being binary integers and therefore not being a sort of appropriate display in an ASCII format. So let me get rid of that for the moment. Uh, and I'll have a look at the full program here, this mmap uh, increment.c. Uh, what this is going to do, as we started looking at a moment ago on the slide, is to treat what's mapped not as character data, but as a pointer to integers. And so uh, through the correspondence that we learned of uh, pointer to integers versus uh, an array of integers, those two things being largely uh, identical to each other, this allows me then to manipulate this thing that's in a file as though it were a pointer to an array of integers in my own program. 
I can calculate, for instance, the length of this array by dividing the total byte sized by however big an integer is. Usually that's four on 64-bit systems. I can then iterate through that array and print it out uh, with a percent %d. This treats then these things as binary integers and will format them using the conventions that printf has. I can also then change them. Uh, just as I changed characters before, I can perform operations on the elements of that array, uh, plus equaling one in this case. Now that performs binary level arithmetic and stores it back at the memory location indicated. Uh, and would otherwise be a little bit hard to arrange because I have to read some integer out into a temporary spot that I stored in my program, and then again, back up a little bit and write it back. But through this uh, memory mapping business, all of this is made fairly seamlessly because this thing just appears as though it were an array that my program owns. Uh, the net effect then uh, is as follows. If I GCC that mmap uh, increment, uh, and I run this a dot out on, I think it'll be binary ints dot that, and press enter. You can see their current values are 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, etc. Uh, and if I run it again, I'll first get a printout of what the last values that were stored in there before the increment. Uh, so if I print out now, you can see before the increment in the second run, I have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, etc. Uh, proving therefore that my previous run of this actually made changes to that. Uh, you can verify that by uh, looking here at the see binary ints dot that I'll maybe call stat on that to get the most recent information uh, this was updated at time uh, let's see 22 and 32 so that's uh, minutes here 02 and 32 uh, seconds if I run it one more time and stat again you can see the values are different uh, and here I've uh, gone up a minute uh, plus six seconds here. So uh, this is changing uh, fairly uh, frequently as I uh, go through. And that's because uh, this memory mapping business that allows adding on to that array of integers is actually changing the file. So then with those things in mind, it's worthwhile to just look briefly at the trade-offs between using your traditional form of IO that's in the form of F reads, F writes, F scan Fs, uh, F print Fs, and so forth, versus this new tool, uh, this M mapping business. M map has a lot to recommend it. First and foremost, it avoids this cycle that creates duplicate data. The operating system is going to have part of your file in memory at the beginning. And the need then to call some user level functions like fread or fscanf to cut copies of that into the program memory that your program is running uh, is completely alleviated. So you don't have this cycle of uh, OS has it in its memory, let me fread it to get a copy of that mine, I'll make some changes and then I'll fwrite it, which copies it back into the OS memory. Uh, this saves generally operations and time because you're just given direct access to that stuff. Turns out that this is so useful that many mechanisms in modern operating systems, uh, Linux in particular, are backed up by this MMAP business. Uh, in particular, uh, we've been using malloc and free for quite a while, uh, but haven't really answered the question, how does malloc get its memory initially? In most implementations, the initial setup for malloc invokes MMAP to map part of the virtual memory space uh, to what is known as the heap. Uh, and in cases uh, that you would want uh, some memory on your own that's sort of directly managed, uh, you can actually mmap it in this way. Uh, in that case, uh, this mmapping business isn't associated with a file when it's used with a heap or something like that, uh, but it's certainly a direct sort of access and manipulation of the virtual memory table associated with the process uh, and is therefore useful for things like uh, uh, malloc. Uh, what is associated with files is something we'll talk about next time, uh, and that much of the library system that is built into Linux these days uh, hinges on MMAP's ability to say, find the instance of printf on this system and map it into this process that's just starting up. That means lots of processes can share one instance of this printf code so long as all they're doing is running that. There are some drawbacks associated with MMAP in that it works with the page table. So all of the memory hunks that it works with are gonna be 4K big. Now in the event that you were using lots of small hunks of memory or mapping uh, or wanting to deal with lots of small files, then it's likely that you'll end up with some wasted space if you're directly attempting to MMAP a lot of this. 
Also, it's the case that MMAP, since it maps a region into memory, it doesn't automatically update as files would change in size. So particularly if you're writing on to the end of files uh, to grow them, then the memory map of them is not going to automatically change with that, and you'd have to take additional steps associated with MMAP to get that to happen. Uh, instead, uh, you'd probably, at the point you're just tacking on to the end of the file a lot, uh, not bother with MMAP and make use of the traditional fwrite in that case. But for many, many tasks in which you are sort of bopping about or wanting access to a file in a certain format, uh, then MMAP is useful. Finally, like most things in C, there's no bounds checking associated with MMAP that's safe. Uh, so if you memory map some portion of a file but go off the end of it, uh, the same thing happens as would happen in other cases in C. If you go, don't go too far off and are still within page bounds, then you're probably okay. But if you go far enough off uh, into the boondocks, then you'll be out of the mapping that the operating system has for you and get a segmentation fault just as you would in other kinds of programs. So uh, that leaves us, uh, I think, with one last topic to discuss later on, which we've alluded to here, uh, that by virtue of the fact that MMAP allows a process to gain access to an operating system area uh, that would normally be sort of hard for it to access and uh, therefore gain direct access, uh, we'll see also that uh, these processes will make use at least indirectly of MMAP in order uh, to map library functions into their virtual address space, thereby reducing the load on the system overall in terms of how much memory is needed uh, for running programs. We'll discuss that in some more detail later on, but do have a look at the M mapping of files. It's a very useful technique and will have play in our last project for the semester. That's all I have for this evening. I hope to see you in lecture to discuss some of this stuff relatively soon. And I hope everyone is generally happy and healthy. Happy hacking until I see you next time.